Every year, the multi-billion dollar proceeds of organized crime are pumped into the global economy, a torrent of dirty money that's laundered through the banking system to disguise its origins. So how's it done? Keen to find out, two journalists began to investigate a man allegedly involved in hiding the vast profits of the Italian Mafia. But as this remarkable three-episode report reveals, little in this complex and secretive world is quite what it seems. Italy is the perfect place to be an investigative journalist. Its complicated history and politics, its food and culture, its ties to the Vatican, even its football. All of these things have been the source of interesting stories in the past. I'm Alessandro Righi, and this is my production partner, Emanuele Piano. For many years, we've made documentary films, and most of them have been pretty straightforward. But the story that we are about to tell you is something else entirely. It isn't routine. It's an enigma, wrapped in riddles, buried in mysteries. It's the most remarkable and complicated story we've ever come across, and we found it almost by accident. It's about money laundering, and much else besides. Over the next three episodes of People in Power, we'll tell you about internet conspiracy theories. Confidence tricksters and organized crime. Poi muovere quei soldi dopo tre secondi li te li trovi addosso e te portano via, non si sa dove te porta. You'll hear the names of a famous Russian movie director a Ukrainian folk dancer, computer hackers, and even African politicians. If there's a possibility that this is a scam, I'm the number one in hunting the scammers. And as we try and make sense of what we uncovered amid all the mysterious businesses and people who don't seem to exist, we'll introduce you to the person at the heart of this complicated web, a man most reluctant to reveal his secrets. Intanto ci spieghi chi è lei e qual è il suo lavoro, insomma, di cosa si occupa. <laughs> Con il film of fiction, io sono quello che <laughs> esattamente risolve i problemi. problemi. Esattamente. But more of him later. For now, let's start where we began almost three years ago, with the international narcotics trade and the Italian mafia. Back in 2020, we were working on another story about organized crime, an all too frequent occurrence for Italian journalists. In the process, we interviewed Marco, a former member of the Ndrangheta, the mafia from the region of Calabria in southern Italy. When I was in the heroin, I was in the heroin. The mandavano sent 3 kg of coca per un kilo di, di heroin bianca. Marco told us that back in the 1990s, the Ndrangheta built ties with Latin American cocaine cartels who wanted to open up markets in Europe. The profits from the distribution of cocaine, he said, were loaded onto trucks and transported from Italy to Switzerland, where complacent banks took the money and sent it out to other international banks. Then, when needed, some of it would come home. In Italy, and the families specific, quello che si necessita. Non è necessario se la mia famiglia in un anno spende un milione, non è necessario avere 10. Che motivo avrei? Sarei uno stupido. Drug trafficking is immensely profitable. The cocaine trade alone is believed to be worth at least 130 billion dollars, and some estimate it could be five times that figure. The Ndrangheta has been controlling cocaine routes from South America to Europe for at least 30 years. In this time, despite the periodic seizures of narcotics, 
authorities have never managed to find the money. Until he retired in 2022, Roberto Pennisi was a senior magistrate in the DNA, the Italian National Anti-Mafia Directorate. Lo scopo delle organizzazioni criminali di tipo mafioso è quello di operare nel mondo della finanza. Sono diventate delle strutture criminali finanziarie. Ma come fanno però? Beh, come fanno? Però... Hanno sempre a disposizione prestanomi o sì. società fittizie che durano anche le spasse del matin per far entrare nel circuito questi soldi. E quel valore aggiunto in più delle organizzazioni criminali, la cui attività comunque, e non è poco, si svolge sempre coperta, direi quasi, dall'ombra del fucile. Finding the money, that's where our own interest in this matter began. For decades, Italian authorities, magistrates and journalists have tried to pierce the veil of secrecy surrounding the Mafia's treasure without ever succeeding and often dying in the process. Omerta, they call it in Italy, the Mafia's code of silence. But in November 2020, when stories from Calabria started appearing in the national press, we thought that this might change. The stories were based on an Italian police report dated February 2018 from the small city of Palmi that spoke of a man called Roberto Ricordare, who was allegedly laundering hundreds of billions of euros on behalf of the Mafia. The first journalist to break the story was Alessia Candito. Ciao Ale, ciao. Ciao. Ci puoi raccontare intanto come hai trovato l'informativa dalla quale è partito il tuo articolo? L'informativa è un documento ufficiale che è stato depositato in un processo che all'epoca era in corso a Reggio Calabria. In questa eh, inchiesta viene fuori una figura molto importante che è quella di un imprenditore che si chiama Recordare. Capiamo che eh, la polizia lo intercettava con dei Trojan e con delle ambientali da almeno due anni. Quello che viene fuori nella lettura della polizia è che Recordare non è semplicemente un imprenditore, eh, Recordare è un riservato in grande. Che cosa significa? Significa che non è un affiliato, è un uomo che è a disposizione non della parte militare dell'Andrangheta, ma dei massimi vertici dell'organizzazione ai quali offre dei servizi. I servizi possono essere di solo e esclusivamente in movimentazione finanziaria. Di quale cifre si tratta? Sono cifre folli, stiamo parlando di operazioni di, di, di miliardi, non di uno, ma di centinaia. But we wanted to know more. If Roberto Ricordare was really moving billions, and how was he doing it? Sembra avere accesso ad una rete di conti che però sono sparpagliati in banche di tutto, di tutto il mondo, tra Cipro, Malta, eh, Israele, eh, Tunisia, eh, Danimarca. Eh, non si tratta di normali conti in banca, quello che tu puoi aprire andando alla filiale sotto casa. Sono legati a delle chiavi alfanumeriche che nell'informativa vengono riportate e fanno tutti riferimento a due persone, uno è Sergio Contessa, un secondo soggetto invece è eh, Dimitri Vertl, che teoricamente è un russo. Questa rete di conti eh, ha un principio unico che li lega, come una ragnatela, che è eh, questa intestazione White Spiritual Boy. Remember that expression, White Spiritual Boy. You'll hear it a number of times. The Italian court files described how the names of two men, Sergio Contessa and Dimitri Vertl, were associated with international bank accounts believed to contain billions of dollars. According to police, Roberto Ricordare was trying to recover these assets for the Mafia, allegations he has always strongly denied. But who exactly were Sergio Contessa and Dimitri Vertl? And why were their names connected to organized crime? Initially, the name Dimitri Verkl didn't throw up anything in our online searches. But we found Sergio Contessa's name in an article from 1989 about a murder at a highway toll gate near Orte in central Italy. 
The report said that on the day Contessa was shot and killed, he was carrying 350 million lire in cash in the trunk of his car. Quando ho saputo dell'omicidio di Contessa, ovviamente siamo rimasti tutti scioccati perché lo conoscevamo. Un po' se l'è cercata perché tutti quei soldi non si portano in macchina. Secondo me l'omicidio di Contessa è stata proprio una rapina finita male. Maddalena Motto worked shoulder to shoulder with Sergio Contessa throughout the late 1980s, lending cash to high rollers at the famous Monte Carlo Casino in Monaco. Together, they ran an operation associated with the casino, known as the Loans Office. L'ufficio Fidi era l'ufficio dove i clienti si rivolgevano per avere un fido e poi rilasciavano un assegno e avevano l'agevolazione di avere le fisce in cambio degli assegni. Questi assegni venivano portati in Italia dai corrieri, bancati in Italia e dopo 7-8 giorni, quando c'era la valuta disponibile, i corrieri prelevavano i contanti e li riportavano per pagare l'ufficio Fidi di Monte Carlo. Sergio era un privilegiato, diciamo, perché è stato, uno dei, è stato uno dei primi, forse il primo ad andare a Monte Carlo. Quindi aveva in mano tutta una clientela vastissima, lavorava moltissimo, ha lavorato per 10, 12, 15 anni, non giocava una lira, al contrario di me, <laughs> Quindi può anche darsi che abbia accumulato tutti questi soldi, non lo so. Whether Sergio Contessa's death was a targeted killing or merely a robbery for cash that went wrong, we didn't yet know. Nor did we yet understand why his name had more recently been used by Roberto Ricordare in connection with supposed mafia bank accounts overseas. Our aim was to try and unlock some of the secrets of Recordare's network, to establish whether he really was the master money launderer that the police had suspected, and if so, what else he and the Mafia might have been up to. But we soon began to realize that nothing in this looking glass world was quite what it seemed. Sergio Contessa was survived by a son, Maurizio. According to the Palmi police wiretaps, in late 2017, Roberto Ricordare received the power of attorney from Maurizio Contessa to administer his father's accounts. We managed to find Maurizio. He agreed to meet us at the tollgate in Orte, where his father was killed over 30 years ago. We wanted to ask him about his father's alleged accounts and whether there was any tangible evidence of their existence. Io l'ho controllato tutto. L'ho fatta attraverso le mie conoscenze. Però come si accede a questi possono... conti? Tramite una banca centrale, tramite una, una banca, tramite no, un hacker? No, si accede attraverso delle persone importanti che conoscono il presidente della banca centrale, il vice direttore della banca centrale. Maurizio denied any connection with the mafia. He claimed that he found documents attesting to the existence of his father's accounts in a briefcase after his father's death. The accounts, he said, were given to his father to administer during the 1980s by the second signatory, Dimitri Vertla. Maurizio also said that he had tried to withdraw the money in the past without ever succeeding. We found evidence that in 2007, Maurizio claimed to have transferred $1.3 billion from Sergio's alleged accounts at the Central Bank of Denmark to an Israeli bank called Hapo Alim. According to Israeli court documents, when Hapo Alim Bank refused to hand over the sum, Maurizio, his brother-in-law, and a third person called Daniele Tasciotti filed a lawsuit against the bank. Maurizio explained that the man called Daniele Tasciotti was an exceptionally skilled hacker who used to work for him. Siamo arrivati in banca, la banca ci ha messo a disposizione Israele, un computer, Apolim. Apolim, un sì. computer di una stanza sì. e Tasciotti attraverso questo computer sì. ha fatto il movimento e ha spostato i soldi. Inserendo nel sistema di trasferimenti con il passaporto, numero di passaporto, ok? E il numero di autorizzazioni sì. e con la gay di Dimitri Verter, sì. ok? E sotto passaporto di papà, numero di passaporto e la che di papà, sì. i soldi sono partiti. 
Maurizio said he works as an art dealer, but what he so candidly described sounded more like a hacking attempt than a banking transaction. He also showed us swift receipts of the alleged transfers. We asked Mario Turla, an expert on money laundering and banking transactions, what swift receipts are and whether the printouts provided by Maurizio Contessa were real. Swift è una società cooperativa che ha sede in Belgio, dove, che è partecipata principalmente da quasi tutte le banche. Che cosa serve Swift? Swift serve per poter eh, effettuare transazioni in eh, quasi tutto il mondo. Swift non sposta nessun denaro, ma bensì sposta e gestisce i vari messaggi che si manda una banca a un'altra dicendo che io invio questo denaro se il sistema SWIFT poi approva viene confermato da un altro messaggio. Queste ricevute SWIFT che ti ho mandato tu cosa ne pensi? Possono essere delle cose reali oppure no? È un report, è un report che viene che, che è stato stampato, potrei farlo benissimo anch'io sul mio PC, sicuramente i codici BIC che sono interno sono corretti delle varie banche, ma questo non, non certifica che ci sia stato fatto il bonifico, da oltretutto cifre molto importanti. According to the Israeli court documents, the lawsuit against Hapolim Bank was discontinued in 2009 because Contessa and his partners failed to pay an advance on legal fees demanded by the court. We contacted Hapolim Bank to ask them what they could tell us about the affair. They replied with a one-line statement. Due to banking secrecy, we are unable to comment on individual clients. We also wrote to Denmark's National Bank, asking about the accounts. They replied, as a central bank, we do not engage in commercial banking activities, and we have no knowledge of the accounts and or transactions as described. It always seemed highly improbable that casino money lender Sergio Contessa ever did have billions of euros stashed away in Denmark's National Bank and other international institutions. But it begged the question, if no such funds existed in the first place, then why was the alleged master money launderer Roberto Ricordare trying through others to access the money? While we puzzled over that riddle, we also tried to find out more about the identity of Dimitri Verkl, the second supposed signatory of the mysterious accounts. Okay. So Dimitri, quindi tu lo sai chi è? Dimitri era un personaggio molto importante in America. Però qual è il suo vero nome? Perché Verkl sicuramente non è il suo vero nome. Questo è il suo vero nome. Ok? Questo è il suo vero nome. Poi c'è altri cinque passaporti. To prove his case, Maurizio Contessa showed us a photocopy of Dimitri Verz's passport. The photograph on it seemed vaguely familiar. We took a moment to translate the Cyrillic script on it. It revealed that the actual name written in Russian on the document wasn't Dimitri Vertl, but that of a far more famous Russian, the legendary movie director Andrei Arsenevich Tarkovsky. The Vertl version of the passport shown by Maurizio Contessa was in fact an obvious fake. E allora tornando, tornando al Dimitri Werther però che tu fai vedere quel documento là. Perché ci sta il nome di Dimitri Werther ma la foto è di Andrei Tarkovsky che ci sta. Maurizio Contessa declined to say more. And of course, it's impossible to say for sure that Andrei Tarkovsky, the movie director, never used the identity of someone called Dimitri Werther. But it seems extraordinarily unlikely. Yet if Dimitri Vettel wasn't Tarkovsky, then who was he? Searching through the archives of websites set up over the years by hacker Daniele Tasciotti, we found the first occurrence of the name Dimitri Vettel. Though spelled slightly differently, the name was published on the website of a UK company called DGF Service Limited in late 2014. DGF Service was part of the network of a mysterious organization called Alpha Omega Station. Its strange manifesto, published in 2014, announced the imminent coming of a new world order. Among other ramblings, AOS claimed to control assets within the Federal Reserve System and at the BIS, the Bank for International Settlements, 
an umbrella organization for central banks. The leader of AOS, we learned, was a Russian man called Vladimir Ivanovich Kobzar. According to background checks run by Italian authorities during a 2014 securities fraud investigation, Vladimir Kobzar had previously been at the center of a number of scams involving fake securities. We wrote to Kobzar, who now seems to reside in the United States, to ask him about Alpha Omega Station. Not for the first time in this investigation, we had a less than clear reply. Kobzar simply told us to look for a man called Daniele Palla, a former commodities broker who could explain the matter to us. Nel, nel mio trascorso e nei contatti che ci sono stati nei confronti di quella cosa lì, ho trovato una figura che si chiama Kobzar, che ha pacchi, 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 pacchi di carta, a forma di certificati, a forma di quelli, cose similari a quelle che fa vedere fuori il consesso. Ma, ma questa Però... roba quando lei l'ha vista le è sembrata, diciamo, tarocca o sembravano delle cose reali? Non ho mai fatto delle due diligence, c'erano delle cose che alla, a, a colpo d'occhio potevano anche sembrare reali, cioè non è tanto l'aspetto estetico della cosa quanto il fatto di fare poi delle verifiche concrete, no? According to files from the 2014 investigation on Vladimir Kobzar and others, in 2009, the Russian forger enlisted hacker Daniele Tasciotti and broker Daniele Palla in his team. In an exchange of emails found in the police files, the latter two discussed the steps to be taken to activate a system of accounts in anticipation of a meeting with Vladimir Kobzar himself. Che cos'è questo sistema che è una cosa che so, che di che cosa si tratta? È una cosa che va in capo a Kobzar e è una cosa dalla quale io ho preso le distanze. Daniele Palla refused to explain further what the system of accounts was all about. The only other person who could answer our questions was the hacker himself, Daniele Tasciotti. We found an address for his family in a small town near Rome and went to look for him. Yeah. Sì, pronto? Sì. Salve, stiamo cercando Daniele. Eh, guarda, Daniele non, non ha più da più. Ah, non sta più qua? No. Scusi, ma da quant'è che, che non lo vede? While we were about to leave, Daniele's family came walking out of the gate. Ha chiamato la finanza, ha chiamato i carabinieri, hanno richiamato i carabinieri, ha chiamato, ha chiamato tutti. Ma invece questa cosa con i computer, lui come c'è da sempre, ce l'ha avuto? Eh, lui, il computer, di, di quello che sentivo io, è un padre eterno perché tutti lo cercavano per sicuro. Ha cominciato con 11 anni a, so, perché, a giocare in là. Io se mi parli di computer, facevo. guarda come sto. Io lo sapevo solo che è Nager. Bravo! Eh, Nager. Nager. Io sapevo solo che lui Ma... è uno, cioè, mm. mh, manco mi ricordo come lo disse lui. Uno mm. dei, tipo, ci stanno sette Hager al mondo, oh, più o meno, lui è uno so. degli Hager. Although his relatives said they hadn't seen him for years, Tashotti seemed to be still active on the web. Through a search in the internet registry who is, we managed to find his fiance's address. We rang the buzzer several times, but were always told that Daniele was out. Finally, we were asked to desist, so we decided to leave a message with our telephone number. But Daniele never called us back. What had started as an investigation into money laundering was quickly turning bizarre. Our findings showed that there was much more inside the Palmi police report that Italian authorities had missed. The banking accounts allegedly managed by Roberto Ricordare seemed to be part of a wider system of special accounts created by a forger or hacker, or both, possibly as part of a money laundering scheme or a fraud was the Mafia's treasure hidden in the folds of this system? Or was it all a smokescreen hiding something else entirely? We were at a dead end. That's when we stumbled on a list of banking operations published by a court in Kiev, Ukraine. One of the operations in the list matched to the letter one of the transactions the Italian police had overheard Roberto Ricordare discussing. It was an apparent transfer of money from Germany to Malaysia. The amount was beyond belief, 2 trillion euros. In the next episode of People in Power, as the mystery deepens, we travel to Ukraine in search of answers 
and some familiar names. Ну тут человек называется Дмитрий Веротчилтылов. 